so we'll get started. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Louise. I'm a currently a PGY4, and today I'll be reviewing the current literature on the clinical implications of the microbiome in urology. First, I'll give a overview of the so-called normal microbiome in the human urinary tract. Then I'll go over what we currently know about the role of the microbiome in lower urinary tract dysfunction, urolithiasis, and finally, urologic cancers. So historically, the urinary tract has been thought of as a sterile entity, but more recently, evidence of microbial communities in the urinary tract have surfaced. The myth that you can drink your own pee because it's sterile has been debunked. Sorry, Bear Grylls. Contemporary studies are now focused on characterizing the urinary microbiome and its implications on health and disease. So the microbiome is the enormous number of microorganisms that colonize the human body and form complex communities. Usually, um, when we talk about a microbiome, it refers to the entire collection of microorganisms in a specific niche. Bacteria tend to be the biggest players, but other microbes, including viruses and fungi, are included as well. We know that specific bacterial communities are found in the normal, healthy urinary tract as well. And the microbiome organisms that live inside and on human skin are estimated to outnumber the um, number of human somatic and germ cells by a factor of 10. All this really launched um, in 2008 with the Human Bi Microbiome Project, which was a logical and conceptual um, extension of the Human Genome Project. I, it set out to characterize the microbiome of five different body sites, primarily GI, but as well as oral, skin, nasal, and urogenital tracts. The urinary system was not part of this study because, again, traditionally, urine was considered to be sterile and healthy individuals. The major conclusion from this human microbiome project was that um, each person likely has a microbiome that's distinct and also stable, but now more and more microbiome research is directed towards understanding how interactions of this microbiome and various host factors like immunity, for example, can alter health and disease. In other body sites, not the urinary tract, the research is much more mature as it's been going on for a longer time. For example, in the 1950s, a fecal microbiome transplant was used to treat C. diff infections, and although the specific method of transplanting the fecal microbiome has changed, it's now a standard of care for complicated C. diff cases. Urine had, was assumed to be sterile for such a long time and overlooked in these microbiome studies since a urine itself is quite hostile to the survival of microorganisms. It is hypertonic with a low pH around six and contains a high concentration of urea, which in itself is inhibitory to a lot of bacteria. Another major contributing factor to the long acceptance of urine as sterile is the clinical procedure of detecting um, bacteria in urine samples. This method has actually been used since the 1950s, which is a long time ago. The protocol specifies that a very small alphot of urine, one microliter, is plated onto only two microbiological media, so a blood agar and a McConkey agar, and it's incubated in for 24 hours in aerobic conditions. Now these culture conditions will favor fast growing aerobic bacteria and are really designed um, for uropathogens such as E. coli, which is fair enough because we know they're quite common and cause pathology. But the, for the bacteria that require special nutrients or take more than 24 hours to grow or prefer anaerobic environments, notably the bladder is low in oxygen. They are frequently um, missed from this screening test. So the subsequent discovery and confirmation of the urobiome was facilitated primarily by two assays which are complementary to each other versus the advance of molecular techniques, specifically the ability for high throughput sequencing of a marker gene, in this case, um, mostly the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, which is 
specific for prokaryotes. These assays um, detected DNA evidence of bacteria. And then the second assay, enhanced urine culture protocols, provided evidence that these microbes detected by the 16S um, sequencing um, were actually alive. This, um, the enhanced protocol would play a larger volume of urine onto more different plates and would incubate um, the bacteria under anaerobic conditions for a longer time. And as you can see, this is the difference between a standard versus enhanced urine culture. Whereas a lot of bugs would have been missed in the standard urine culture, a ton of them pop up into different conditions. With the core human microbiome, the existence of it being established, the next questions are, could a healthy um, urine microbiome be productive, providing a degree of hemostasis in response to normal variations during competition, or could depletion or alteration of the normal urine microbiome host innate barriers um, and innate uh, immune system and lead to pathology and bladder function? There are a number of urologic conditions which do not necessarily include a bacterial origin for diagnosis, which shows features of a altered microbiome with um, specific urotypes dominating, in contrast to urine from asymptomatic healthy individuals, and the growing insights of these into the impact of um, the urinary biome on these entities could help us gain a deeper understanding of the condition and provide guidance for optimized management. But first, before we can talk about pathology, we have to talk about normal or so-called normal. So we've kind of discussed that there's ample evidence to say that there's definitely a microbial community in the healthy bladder. But as I alluded to before, compared to the micro other body sites, the urinary microbiome is relatively poorly characterized and understood. Most of the research we have um, comes from studies looking at women with urinary symptoms and then comparing them with asymptomatic women. What we do know is that men and women differ in the predominant your, your, um, organisms. The major urotypes in women include lactobacillus and gardenella, and major urotypes in men include cornibacterium, staphylococcus, and streptococcus. Present in small numbers, they presumably don't cause any symptoms in these people, but in larger numbers or in shifts, um, they could obviously cause problems as well. And something that's um, important um, for microbiome studies is that, as we know, voided urine doesn't really adequately characterize the bladder urobiome because the contamination by the urethral um, microbiome really confounds this. So in studies, um, casterized urine um, is mostly used instead. And the specific composition of the microbiome is very fluid and it fluctuates with various disease states and also um, fluctuates physiologically um, with age, for example. In particularly, studies have um, suggested that lactobacillus is more common in premenopausal women. And further, with both age and increase in BMI, there's an increase in microbial diversity. So there's a more even distribution of um, various species, various taxa, and a loss of a dominant species. Now that we've established in the lower urinary tract, even asymptomatic healthy individuals that host a complex microbial um, community, in the strictest of definitions, all individuals are technically bacteric. The textbook definition of asymptomatic um, bacteria is growth more than 10 to 5 colony forming units of a single uropathogen, the most common being E. coli and normal urinary tract or enterobacter, other gram positives and those with comorbidities, pseudomonas, proteus and hospitalizations, casterized patients. But without any clinical symptoms, bacteria of any magnitude is technically considered asymptomatic bacteria. When a patient does report symptoms, then it is no longer symptomatic and then considered a urinary tract infection. 
But the problem is that individuals may present with urinary complaints suggestive of a UTI who have negative urine cultures by standard aerobic cultivation techniques. Um, standard urine cultures uh, miss a lot of the growth of bacteria and the fact that the diagnosis of UTI relies on the very unlikely principle that the only organism detectable with um, those methods is kind of clinically concerning. Obviously, on the flip side, not all detectable bacteria um, are pathogenic or would cause symptoms. There's recent evidence that reports bacteria um, in a, there are bacteria present in about 90% of no growth standard urine cultures. It just wasn't grown in those specific um, conditions. It's rather complicated to delineate differences between asymptomatic bacteria with non-specific LUT secondary to storage dysfunction or other conditions like OAB. Um, and that may eventually rely on the development of or integration of um, different culture techniques into clinical practice to um, differentiate between these two entities. So there's been a lot of attention for lactobacillus in the role of preventing or reducing the number of UTIs given its presence in the normal microbiome um, and its role in the urogenital tract. And basically, there's no definitive evidence saying that um, it is helpful, but the evidence is also not able to definitively rule it out. The problem is that when taking probiotics, basically as soon as you stop taking the probiotics, the microbiome shifts back to its early state very quickly, and many of the studies don't have um, the participants taking the probiotics for a long enough time to really see and also not every single strain of lactobacillus is anti-inflammatory protective. And many of these um, studies um, included in the Cochrane Review, for example, include strains that are not exactly um, effective. So it's very kind of confusing evidence at this point. So the take home points from this is a standard urine culture misses a lot of growth of bacteria and can mislead someone to over or under treating patients based on kind of the traditional paradigm we have. Um, in the meantime, we should practice antibiotic stewardship and not prescribe antibiotics for asymptomatic bacteria because everybody is bacteric and we really don't know about the um, effect of probiotics and recurrent UTIs. Next, functional disorders like urinary, or urinary incontinence or overactive bladder don't really have a bacterial origin for diagnosis, but these conditions all show features of an altered microbiome with specific dominating neurotypes in contrast to urine from an asymptomatic healthy individual. So we'll talk about that now. So in terms of urge urine incontinence, in comparison to normal healthy controls, there is a statistically significant difference in the frequency and abundance of bacteria present. And although lactobacillus was isolated from both cohorts, um, there were distinctions at the species level. Again, some species are protective more so than others. And also the majority of um, studies up to date um, report the greater general urinary biodiversity is associated with a reduced incidence and severity of urge urine incontinence, as well as a improved treatment response. And notably, with um, certain um, medications like sulfenicin, there's actually um, a study that differentiated responders versus non-responders. Non-responders were actually more likely to have a diverse community, more so than responders, but this was in the absence of lactobacillus dominance, and they often included bacteria not typically found in responders. And very interestingly, after treatment with it, um, it increased the prevalence of lactobacillus, and I think this was a more lasting effect than just probiotics alone. Stress urine incontinence is um, thought of as more of a 
anatomic structural issue. So um, not, not surprisingly, in studies, they haven't found a strong association between bacterial diversity and stress during continence um, symptoms. But there were um, a couple of bacteria associated with um, symptoms severity and again it may represent a slightly a bit of a maybe a mixed urinary incontinence picture or something else is going on we don't really know in terms of overactive bladder there's a very similar story compared to normal controls there's difference in the frequency and abundance of bacteria present and again lactose bacillus is one of those bacteria that um, that showed a difference between symptomatic and asymptomatic controls. Again, in interstitial cystitis, there was a lower bacterial diversity and a difference in the lactobacillus. A specific strain of lactobacillus was associated with less severe scores on the symptom um, index, and this was also associated with differential levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines which suggests that perhaps um, in the microbiome of those with symptoms, the specific composition of the microbe leads to a more or less inflammatory state leading to um, the symptoms. So all this is in women, and I only found very limited studies in men in terms of um, lower urine tract symptoms anyways. There was um, one that looked at IPSS severity, and this was in men both undergoing Let's be paid surgery, so really TERPs, or other completely unrelated surgeries, and they all filled out the IPSS score. And interestingly, the detectable um, bacteria, the amount of it kind of correlated with the IPSS scores. So the in 22% with men with mild LUTs, um, there was a detectable bacteria, 30% in moderate, and almost 60% in severe. And the author suggested um, that a, you know, assessment of the micro, urinary microbiome could help reduce bothering urinary symptoms and reduce the risk of perioperative urinary tract infections. So the take home point for this section is that in patients with lower urinary tract dysfunction compared to normal controls, there is very consistently difference in the diversity of bacteria present. It seems that a higher diversity has a protective effect in general. And there's also a difference in the type of bacteria present, although there's distinction for lactobacillus at the species level. Next, we'll change gears and talk about the microbiome in terms, with, in terms of what we know about its relation to stone formation. Microbiotism have a very established role in the formation of struvite stones, and I will not belabor the point, but um, it's quite well known that some UTI-associated bacteria produce urease, which then breaks down urea, which then increases pH and can lead to struvite stone formation. So it's a very clear case of a gain of function dysbiosis of um, the microbiome that causes this. Something that's less known in terms of non-infectious um, stones when you culture just a calcium oxalate stone that was not um, associated with struvite or infection, almost a third of them demonstrate some sort of bacterial growth when cultured, and will grow Enterobacter or Gardnella lactobacillus. And it's, it's very possible that these um, bacteria are just bystanders in the bladder that got encased when the stone was formed, because we know they are present in a uh, normal, healthy individual or they could have a more direct effect. And some people have hypothesized that the um, bacteria within the stone's microbiome have contributed to the stone formation, either by alterating the urine's um, supersaturation of specific solutes, or by changing the urine pH and um, predisposing someone to forming stones. Now, other than that, there's no studies linking the presence of non-pathogenic bacteria in the urine with kidney stones, but there is a ton of research on the intestinal microbiome and how various non-pathogenic bacteria has linked to kidney stone formation. I think this is kind of all where the 
microbiome and urology all started. So there's um, lots of studies on how the kidney stone formers have a very distinct gut microbiome. And one specific one, ox oxalobacter formigenes, is the kind of the poster child for this. The colonization of oxalobacter is inversely correlated um, with the risk of stone formation. So if you, this one study reports a 70% risk reduction in those colonized with oxalobacter. And oxalobacter colonization rates have been noted in a number of other pathological conditions, and they're all associated with the formation of calcium oxalate stones as well, so it's not just in neurology. The bacteria itself is a gram-negative that metabolizes dietary and endogenous oxalate and thereby decreases urinary oxalate um, excretion. And studies um, have associated colonization with the stone with significantly lower urinary oxalate secretion, which um, lends something to the mechanism. And plasma oxalate concentrations are higher. And all this is inversely associated with the number of stone episodes. All seems very promising. Um, but more recent studies have suggested that it's really not just this one bacteria in these people who are colonized as um, oxalobacter. They actually have an extensive microbial network with many microbes, many bacteria that are all associated with uh, oxalate metabolism that um, work together and decrease the risk of stone recurrence together. Given that there's um, so much interest in this, lots of groups have studied the potential of using oxalobacter as a probiotic. Very early um, research, there um, was a study saying that a single oral dose of oxalobacter followed by dietary oxalate load reduced and significantly decreased urinary oxalate secretion and prolonged um, colonization. By prolonged, it was really only a couple of months during the study period. And I think afterwards they looked and this benefit was mostly gone. And more recently, RCT failed to show significant treatment effect of aoxalobacter probiotic, although they suggested there was maybe a small treatment effect when they um, actually normalize the urine oxalate for creatinine. And I think part of the reason why that these probiotics were not as promising as one might have hoped is that it's really not one bacteria, it's a whole host of bacteria involved in oxalate um, metabolism that contribute to the protective effect. And just recently last year, there was one group who tried in mice um, to do a fecal transplant of the oxalobacter, similar to the idea in C. diff, and they did have preliminary success in reducing urinary oxalate um, levels, but again, this was in animal studies. Another interesting um, part of the oxalobacter story um, is the role of antibiotics. So this specific um, bacterial strain is susceptible to many antibiotics, including ones we use commonly like quinolones, macrolides, and metronidazole. So one group compared oxalobacter colonization between a H. pylori positive group treated with antibiotics versus a normal control group. And in most of the people who were treated with antibiotics, um, unsurprisingly, kind of lost their colonization with um, oxalobacter. And interestingly, only one of these patients out of a small group, to be fair, about 30, um, regained um, colonization with oxalobacter after six months. So this suggests that there's a very lasting elimination of oxalobacter and presumably other beneficial bacteria, um, which may be a risk factor for kidney stone formation. So there are take home points from this section, this biosis of the urinary microbiome could dispose the host to urinary stone formation. And secondly, a lasting emulation of oxalobacter and other intestinal microbes associated with oxalate metabolism after antibiotic exposure could be a risk factor in itself for kidney stone formation. For the final section, I will talk about uh, current evidence for a mechanistic role of both the urinary and intestinal microbiome in 
urologic cancer um, pathogenesis and treatment response. Comparatively, this is a much newer subfield of research, but there is definitely mounting evidence of the role of the microbiome and potential for uh, future work. We'll talk about prostate cancer first. In the urinary tract of um, men um, with proven prostate cancer on biopsy, there was a higher prevalence of pro-inflammatory bacteria and uropathogens compared to normal controls. So in um, cluster map, specifically streptococcus, for example, was more common. And if you recall, this is a normal um, bacteria found in um, men with no symptoms, presumably no cancer, but um, in maybe slight, even slightly um, higher amounts in concert with other bacteria around, um, it could cause more inflammation, for example. And a lot of the other bacterial species that were higher in men with prostate cancer um, have been implicated at some point in urogenital infections as well. So perhaps it creates a more inflammatory state. And again, all these studies are relatively new and few. So there's not that many in the urine only, but there's another study that looked at the fecal uh, microbiome in men with uh, prostate cancer and the bacterial communities of men with and without prostate cancer were mostly overlapping, except for some small differences. For example, again, streptococcus species was seemingly more present. And the authors concluded that um, the interaction of the microbiome and the balance of inflammatory, anti-inflammatory bacterial um, lipopolysaccharides, um, as well as um, metallism of folate may all create, or may all play roles in creating a systemic pro or anti-carcinogenic um, state, because these were the ones that showed small amounts of differences. But again, this is a very preliminary early study. And finally, there was one other study who looked at the microbiome and prostate tissue itself in men with um, prostate cancer. And there was a diverse um, microbial um, signature in the prostate cancer samples compared to just BPH. And interestingly, they were able to cluster the microbiome signatures into kind of three separate ones, and these correlated with different grades and stage, which prevents provides um, some uh, way for clinical diagnosis or outcome predictions. They hadn't yet done a lot of functional analysis on these different um, microbial signatures, but as a proof of concept, they tried um, a couple, for example, um, they found the Heliobacter um, CGA oncogene sequences were integrated within specific chromosomes um, of the prostate tumor cells in one cluster. So that's just one example of more functional analysis that we want to do in the future to see if these clusters have any mechanistic effect on the development of prostate cancer. And in terms of clinical considerations, um, one um, group looked at patients undergoing androgen access targeted therapies and how this affected their fecal microbiome. So they looked at um, patients with localized disease, biochemically current disease, metastatic disease, and their um, androgen target therapies included biclunamide, enzalutamide, and abiraterone. And they um, found that the GI uh, microbiota changed um, after um, duration of the androgen targeted therapies. Specifically, there was enrichment of bacterial pathways promoting androgen synthesis. Another interesting thing they found um, was that two specific um, bacteria, which I will not try to pronounce, were more prevalent, but these bacteria were linked to response to anti PD1 immunotherapy. And this could be one possible explanation for why certain men, not others, respond to anti PD1 immunotherapies. Um, next. I'll talk briefly about bladder cancer. I did not find that many um, studies on it. They're all very 
very small and very new, but um, the kind of summary of what I found was that certain bacteria um, seem to be more prevalent and ones they really honed in on are fusobacterium since it's a possible pro-tumorogenic um, pathogen. Um, other um, bacteria they found were more abundant in patients specific with a high risk of recurrence and progression, but remains to be um, validated. And the evidence on this is not very strong. Studies are normally 10 to 20 patients, and it's um, just uh, all starting. So the take-home points um, from this is the microbiome may have a role in the um, pathogenesis diagnosis of cancers. And I think more interesting, there may be a role of the microbiome in the metabolic response to medications and the response to therapies. So to conclude, there's a microbiome associated with the healthy urinary tract that can change in urologic disorders. It's a exciting field with, with much more work needed to be done in terms of larger studies, going beyond just identifying the bacteria to doing more sequencing to define the function of the bacteria and um, what role they play in interacting with the host. Uh, there's many exciting directions this work can lead to, including new diagnostic predictive um, microbiome-based biomarkers, there's potential for urobiome transplants, and there's much more work to be done on the role of probiotics, prebiotics, and diet potentially as a treatment um, for urologic disorders. A little plug for UBC, there's a bunch of research going on here about, um, for example, the intestinal microbiome in stone formers, which is still a very um, hot topic. Dr. Black and Dr. Land are working on looking at the urinary microbiome of BCG responders versus non-responders. Perhaps the microbiome creates a more inflammatory state, which could presumably um, change whether BCG um, causes any um, response in the patients with bladder cancer. And also Dr. Herman, Dr. Land, you're um, looking at whether differences in the microbiome may um, predispose a transplant patient to early or late rejection. Thank you to all the helpful contributions to my presentation, especially Dr. Land, she's a true expert in the field.